Good evening. Welcome to Montgomery Heart and Wellness. I'm Dr. Baxter Montgomery, and welcome to another show. Uh, I have an interesting topic. Many of you may have heard of diastolic heart failure and chronic kidney disease. Uh, I did a presentation on heart failure not long ago, and I discussed the issue of congestive heart failure. A number of you in the comments section asked me to talk about diastolic heart failure and kidney disease. So I, I coined this uh, title, uh, A Stiff Heart and Weak Kidneys. So I'm going to share with you the underlying causes of what we refer to in medicine and cardiology as diastolic heart failure. It's the most common cause of heart failure and frequently it's associated with kidney failure. Now I'm gonna go through the underlying causes of both of these conditions and how they coexist. And if you stick with me toward the end, I'm gonna give you some simple steps as how you can either avoid this condition or reverse it if you have it. So first and foremost, what is uh, the condition of a stiff heart and weak kidneys and how can you overcome it? Well, as many of you know, if you've seen my other videos, heart failure is simply the inability of the heart to circulate blood according to the body's needs. Now, oftentimes people have that phrase heart failure and you are concerned, is it, does it mean my heart's gonna stop? Is, am I gonna drop dead the next moment? Uh, no, uh, it just simply means that your heart is not circulating your blood according to your needs. So uh, maybe when you're sitting still, uh, you're fine, but maybe you want to climb some stairs, you're short of breath. Uh, you may want to go for a walk, you get short of breath, or you get tightness in the chest. It could be heart failure, it could be coronary disease. Uh, or some people may get short of breath just sitting still or lying flat. So they have a spectrum of condition, the manifestation of heart failure. But there are two types of heart failure. There's systolic heart failure when the heart is too weak so it's dilated and too weak to circulate adequate blood. But there's another form of heart failure when the heart is squeezes normally, but it's too stiff. And we call that diastolic heart failure. So <clears throat> essentially the heart contracts normally, but it's too stiff to relax normally. So as a result, you have a decreased amount of blood that's able to fill the heart. And because there's a decreased amount of blood that fills the heart, uh, there's a decreased amount of blood that circulates. So the less blood that comes in, the less blood that can be ejected out. So, for instance, a heart that can eject blood, say, at 60%, which is a normal ejection fraction, uh, let's say it's so stiff, instead of filling up with a liter of blood, it can fill up with only 500 milliliters of blood, half the amount. So even though it's ejecting 6%, it's ejecting 60% of 500 instead of 6% of a liter which essentially is half the amount. And so even though it's normal squeezing, the lack of relaxation impairs its ability to circulate blood. So I'm gonna go through this uh, next set of slides fairly quickly to give you some understanding of how the heart works. If you've seen some of my other talks, you've, um, you've uh, understood this, the heart is essentially a pump. Uh, it beats about 100,000 times a day uh, you have two sides. You have the left side where it circulates blood to what we call the systemic part of the body, your brain, your arms, your legs, your GI tract. And we have the right side, and it circulates blood to your lungs. That's called your pulmonary circulation. That's an important part because that's where the blood goes and gathers oxygen to then be circulated to the liver to the rest of the body. Uh, the, heart, the heart feeds itself, it has its own coronary arteries, it has, that's its own plumbing, so it circulates oxygenated blood to its own muscles so that it can function normally. It has its own nervous system, we call it the electrical system of the heart, and so it keeps the heart synchronized uh, and beating in an orderly fashion. And as I said before, there are two types of heart failure, diastolic and systolic. As you can say, systolic patients with systolic heart failure can have a dilated heart, Patients with diastolic heart failure frequently have a thickened uh, heart muscle wall, and we'll talk about why that's the case later. What causes systolic function? Uh, if you have coronary disease, you can have a heart attack. You have valvular disease that puts abnormal stress and pressure on the heart. You can have electrical disease, uh, and also uh, you can have a combination of any of these conditions that can weaken the heart. 
However, there are some common causes of diastolic heart failure that can give someone diastolic heart failure before they may progress to systolic heart failure. High blood pressure over a long period of time, diabetes, um, metabolic syndrome and obesity, and there are certain types of infiltrated disease, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, and then many others that have some very, very uh, unusual names. But they can cause infiltration of the heart muscle. Some of this infiltration can be scar or fibrosis. Uh, it could be other types of proteinaceous material that cause the heart muscle to be thickened and stiff. So it's not really contributing to the muscle function of the heart, but really actually stiffening uh, the muscle uh, of the heart up. So let's move on to kidney failure. So now you know what can cause diastolic heart failure. What's kidney failure? Well, kidney failure is simply the inability of the kidneys to filter the blood to maintain healthy blood chemical and electrolyte balance. So the kidneys, along with the liver to a certain extent, helps keep the blood filtered and clean. This is important because if the blood has an imbalance of acid base or it has abnormal electrolytes, all of the other organs can malfunction. So um, what causes the kidney or how does the kidney work? Well, the kidney, as I said, is a filter of electrolytes and kidney dysfunction can lead to either overload of acid in the blood. It can lead to excess amounts of electrolytes such as potassium. Uh, it can have a metabolic imbalance of other types. It can also result in fluid overload if the kidney is not functioning normally. Uh, it may retain excess fluid. Uh, it can lead to worsening heart function as well. And so kidney failure can contribute to heart failure or worsening existing heart failure. So how do the kidneys work? Well, kidneys are made of basic blood vessels and tubules. That's kind of two major components of the kidneys. Um, they have these basic filtering units. We refer to them as nephrons. Uh, so the nephrons are where the blood vessels intersect with the tubules within the kidney. And I'm going to show you some diagrams of how that works. Uh, toxins and excess electrolytes are filtered out of the blood into the tubules at the side of the nephrons. The greater the number of these healthy nephrons, these are the filtering units in your, your kidney, the healthier the kidney. And each kidney can have anywhere from, uh, say, around a million on average nephrons, but there's a wide range getting from 200,000 to 2.5 million, depending on uh, the person, the age, the level of health, the genetics, et cetera. So what's the basic anatomy of the kidney? Many of you may be familiar with this shape of the kidney, uh, shaped like a kidney bean, hence the name kidney. Uh, and then you have this little tubule that goes on. It's the ureter. You may have heard of that. Many of you have had kidney stones. You have understand what a ureter is. You may have had stents placed there. If you take a little wedge section out of this kidney and look at it under the microscope, you'll see some of these little nephrons. And you take a closer look, the nephrons has blood vessels going inside this little open area here. And this capillary bled, uh, bed here is what we call the glomerulus. Now, many of you who have kidney issues, uh, have your doctors talk about what's called a GFR, glomerular filtration rate. The GFR or glomerular filtration rate talks about how effective the blood is cleaned up right in these different glomeruli. So again, you have about a million of these nephrons and uh, similarly a million of these glomeruli and they're filtering the blood all the time. So the rate in which it cleans the blood or filters the blood is what's called your glomerular filtration rate. And uh, here's another anatomically correct image of a nephron, a glomerulus. And you see the blood vessels, the capillaries go around these tubes and the, the unwanted electrolytes and, and chemicals are seeped into the nephron and the nephron then connects what's called connecting tubules and this goes out into urine. So if you look at a very basic uh, cartoon, you have blood coming in and you have these molecules and it circulates through the capillaries and you have these filters where the unwanted chemicals seep out to the capillaries into the ureter, into the tubules. And it goes out and through the tubules and collecting ducts, and it comes out as urine. So filtered, unfiltered blood goes into the kidney. Filtering occurs in the blood capillaries within the nephrons and the glomeruli. 
and the blood waste goes out through the tubules into the bladder. Um, the basic cause of kidney failure. Here they are, very simple. You have decreased flow into the kidneys. Poor circulation, dehydration can cause, contribute to that. You can have damages in the blood vessels, uh, atherosclerosis, autoimmune disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, infection. Or you can have damages to the tubules, autoimmune disease, obstruction like kidney stones, infection, etc. So these are the basic causes of kidney failure. And these are the different sites, decreased flow inside, damage to the blood vessels or damage to the tubules. It's as simple as that. And so if your doctor say you have chronic kidney disease, then you say, well, doctor, uh, is it you know, due to abnormal flow into my kidneys or is it due to damage to the blood vessels or due to damage in my tubules? So underlying health conditions, what are some of the common health conditions that contribute to both diastolic heart failure and kidney disease? Well, hypertension. It causes thickening and stiffening of the heart. Uh, it can also cause blood vessel disease in the kidneys. Diabetes can also cause thickening and stiffening of the heart and scarring of the heart muscle. It can also cause blood vessel disease in the kidneys. Autoimmune disease, again, through inflammation, this autoimmune process can cause scarring and stiffening of the heart. It can also cause scarring of the blood vessels, uh, damage to the blood vessels, also damage to the tubules. But dehydration is a very, very common contributing factor to uh, kidney disease because it contributes to hypertension. When you're dehydrated, the kidneys uh, sense that you're in shock and they send out hormones that cause the blood vessels to constrict and it causes the blood pressure to go up. And of course, medications. Oftentimes people you know, have high blood pressure who are diabetic. They're on medications for their high blood pressure. They may be on diuretics, which makes them more dehydrated. Uh, it can also paradoxically increase the blood pressure. Uh, also, some of the medication can contribute to changes in blood vessels within the kidneys that can also increase the uh, creatinine or decrease the GFR. So there are underlying conditions uh, that contribute. So if you know the contributing factors, then all you have to do is address what those contributing factors are. So what are the three steps to combat this condition? Very simple. First and foremost, you want to optimize hydration. Optimizing hydration is a very simple thing to do. Sometimes it's not as easy uh, as you may think. Now, I obviously, people say, well, I drink a lot of water. The key to optimal hydration is to eat your water. In other words, you want to consume hydrating foods, consume cucumbers, consume apples and oranges. During the certain times of the year, melons are in season, watermelon, cantaloupe. If you're consuming lots of hydrating food, the form of water that comes through these fruits are special compared to, say, water out of a plastic bottle or a glass bottle, for that matter. One, it's more structured. It's more hydrating. Sometimes you make cold-pressed juices or cold-pressed smoothies. But these, this form of water, this form of hydration is going to be much more effective. Step two, you want to naturally control the underlying disease. If you have high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, optimal nutrition is the key. Optimal nutrition, as many of you know, we prescribe a plant-based nutrition for our patients to reverse diabetes, high blood pressure, and we heart and wellness. Uh, we've prescribed detox, but once you're able to control the disease naturally, then you can come off medication that may be contributing to kidney damage or dehydration or the like. Oftentimes people have arthritis and they're taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. In this setting, uh, you may be contributing to worsening kidney function through NSAIDs. And of course, step three, you want to minimize medications. Again, by optimizing your, your lifestyle, you can reverse these illnesses and also come off medications. So these are three important steps. So what is the MHW approach? What do we do for our patients? Now, we see lots of patients come in with fairly advanced kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. They also have advanced heart failure, both systolic and diastolic, and oftentimes they come in with this combination of illnesses. And so we have to be fairly aggressive. So our basic approach to helping reverse early diastolic heart failure and kidney failure is as follows. Aggressive hydration. We'll often put them on a cold-pressed juice feast. Uh, it may be with or without uh, fresh smoothies. 
Uh, we may uh, choose low potassium juice and smoothies, depending on how well they balance the potassium. Uh, but they only do cold plus juice. They do a juice or a smoothie feast, and that's the only uh, food or beverage consumption. Uh, also, we uh, have a time-restricted calorie consumption uh, period. that I think that we should all not be afraid of, but rather approach in an aggressive manner using optimal nutrition, which is a very simple, straightforward approach to reversing this condition. So uh, I hope that you got a lot out of this. Uh, don't forget, if you're free to the, if you're for, uh, new to the channel, uh, please uh, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, join us. You'll get lots more information that's very helpful. Uh, and of course, share this information with many individuals who I'm sure you know can benefit from it. And one last word, many of you uh, who follow us uh, normally see our clinical rounds. We are working on a new set of clinical rounds series, so stay tuned. We'll be coming up with that in the coming days to weeks. So until next time, you take care, and I hope this information finds you doing well. Thank you very much.